The scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word out of reverence for the Lord and his word? Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to be the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended in the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. As he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by the wind of every doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped, when each spirit, each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is God's word. It is true and is given out of his love. You may be seated. Good morning couple of announcements. First, uh, if you're a guest with us, we're so thankful that you're here, and I hope you feel welcome. Uh, we would love to get to know you a bit better, and there is a blue wall out in the lobby, and our connections team is there. They would love to get information from you so we can invite you into our body more effectively. And or you can go online to biblechurch.life, and there's a digital connect card, and you can fill that out, and that will help us again invite you into our life. Also, if you've been coming a while and you want to take a next step, we have a newcomer's lunch next Sunday right after this service, 12.30 p.m., back in our chapel. Our staff will be there, and there will be free food. And so I say, if there's food and it's free and there's fellowship, you should be there. And we'll uh, talk a little bit more about our church, our vision, and our mission. Speaking of vision and mission, before we get back into Genesis... I thought we would do a quick month-long series on the mission of our church, culminating in our missions week. You have heard it twice this morning already, and if you were paying attention, you hopefully have it memorized by this point, but let me put up our mission statement. If you are wondering what is this church about, what is the focal reality of what we do, this is it. In fact, I'm going to make a request. And I think all of you are capable of doing this, even you young people in this room. Would you be willing, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to commit this to memory? To help with that, often orally speaking something out loud helps you do that. So can we say this together? Our mission is to equip our church as a community to reach the triangle and beyond with the message of Jesus. As I did this in the first service, I thought, wouldn't it be awesome, I wish I had told Colin to do this, to highlight the three most important words in there. But you know what? He had already thought about it. So equip, community, and reach are the pathways, the vital ways that we're going to get about this mission. And today we're going to talk about equip. All three of these are interrelated and interdependent And this is the expression of a healthy church, a biblical church. This mission statement will inform, form, limit, and free our life together as we submit to the Word of God and the gospel that it proclaims. Now, if you're like me, sometimes you say, you know what, churches are into this, people are, you know, coach organizations to have a clear mission 
statement, but man, so often the organization doesn't actually abide by it. It's just a piece of paper. So I felt convicted that rather than wondering if we're really going to do this this time, I should pray. So would you join me in praying? Lord, we really give this to you. And we need to surrender to you in your spirit. Um, we have the capability and the brain power and the organizational power in this church to do this, but we can't do it in the flesh. We repent of that. I ask that you would send your spirit so we do this in the spirit. And, as Ephesians 3 says, because of that you would do immeasurably more than we could ask or even imagine. I give you this time, even today, demonstrate your power in that we won't just learn, but we would actually be transformed. We pray it for the sake of Christ, who is our head, who we are designed to grow up into. Amen. Several years ago, we were going through the book of Romans, and we came to chapter 12. And from there, I had a definition of a healthy church. And this is what we saw. A healthy church is where every member is receiving biblical instruction, servanthood training, and spiritual nurture, so that with a pivot foot in this local church, meaning sometimes you will use it in the programmatic ministry of this church, but often you're using it Monday through Saturday in your spheres, in formal and informal ways, they're using their God-given gifts to serve Jesus Christ in the spheres God has put them all week long. This is what we're going to talk about this morning. However, when we talk about spiritual maturity and discipleship, this isn't everything, and I want to just get that out on the front end. In fact, there's a three-legged stool that is vital to the whole of the Christian life. There is the fruit of the Spirit, the growth in Christian character, okay? As Jesus works himself into us in terms of our moral formation, this is done by the disciplines of the Spirit, our life in the Word of God, our life in prayer, our life in discipleship relationships, things like that. And the gifts of the Spirit are also vital, often underappreciated and undertaught in a church like ours. But let me say that you've got to have all three of these. In fact, so many of the issues of the American church right now is that we've put a huge premium on giftedness. Giftedness that creates large churches and lots of publishing and celebrity without a focus on character. And that is disastrous. So today we will focus on the gifts of the Spirit, but man, is it important to have all three of those growing together at the same time. So here's our flow for the morning. We're going to talk about equipped from the Bible because we want to make sure we're staying to the line of Scripture. We're going to have an overview of some of the gifts the Spirit gives. We're going to talk about how to discover your gifts. And finally, we're going to talk about why this is so muddy in many Christian churches. So equipped from the Bible, turn back with me to Ephesians 4. The book of Ephesians is broken into two sections. Chapters 1 through 3 is often talked about the doctrines of the gospel, the indicatives of the faith. And then 4 through 6 is the application of the gospel, the life of faith. The big theme of Ephesians is that God has this cosmic and glorious plan through his son Jesus Christ to unite his people, Jew and Gentile, into one unified temple of the Holy Spirit, and temples are designed for worship. And that worship overflows its banks to change the world. Now, we have been in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, a couple of times in the past 12 months. So today, we're going to look at 7 through 16. In fact, this is the core passage, I would say, where we get this equip mission. Now, turn with me then to verse 7, Ephesians 4, verse 7. And it begins by saying, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is actually not talking about our salvation. This is not talking about justification. This grace given to us is the same grace that Paul talks about in places like Romans 12. It is the graced gifts of the Spirit. And then he goes on to quote Psalm 68, 18. Now, he's not 
quite quoting it verbatim. I would actually argue he is kind of preaching quoting that song. Now, let me show you what it says in the original Hebrew text, English translation. It says, you ascended on high, the Lord, leading a host, a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts or spoils of war among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. The picture is God, the divine warrior, who is at a battle against his enemies, and he is won. And in the ancient Near East, you have spoils of victory. And so he receives those. The, the conquered kings and kingdoms must give tribute to the, uh, the victorious king who is the Lord. Now, go to our passage, and this is what Paul does with it. In verse 8, he says, When he, that is Jesus, ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Do you see that? He didn't just receive the gifts. He didn't hoard the gifts. But Jesus now is the one who has come down, he says. That's his incarnation. And then he ascended back to the Father. After his victory on the cross, he is resurrected. He goes back to the Father. And what is he doing? He is giving out the spoils of his defeat over sin, death, and the devil. Those are the captives. They have been defeated. And they have given over victory to him. And I love it that this is a picture of Jesus now gifting the church. And how does he do that? Verse 11, by giving what I will call 4.5 gifts to the church. I'll describe what I mean by that. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and you see shepherds and teachers or pastors and teachers, the way the grammar works is it's probably one office, the teaching pastors. Okay, That fourfold office is the spoils of war for the church. The apostles were the 11 plus Paul. And they, by the Spirit, gave us the New Testament. So I would say by extension for us today, we are given the gift of the New Testament and by extension, the Old Testament, so the scriptures, okay? Then the prophets, those who speak forth the word of God or an application of the word of God by the power of the Spirit. The evangelist, traveling, itinerant messengers of the gospel proclaiming it, so that men and women will come to follow Jesus. Then the pastor teachers are shepherds of local congregations anchored in that one space whose ministry is rooted in teaching the whole word of God to proclaim the whole Christ for the wholeness of the body. So I will speak for my colleagues and not for myself right now. They are a gift. They are God's gift to you. The elders of this church, the pastors of the ministers of this church, are gifts to you. They fulfill these offices. But they are gifts in as much as they do the second thing, which we see in verse 12, and that is pour into you to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That is where we get the term equip. Our role, our use of our reality as a spoil of war is to equip, to train, to instruct, to guide, to help you grow in your ability to use the grace gifts God has given each one of you for the building up of this body so that we re re uh, re receive full maturity in Jesus Christ in loving unity. So we've used a couple of analogies through the years to describe this. One is the cruise ship versus the aircraft carrier. Many people look at churches, especially larger churches, as a cruise ship where you've got a staff they run the, the, the ship so you can have pina coladas and sunbathe and go to ports of call. That is not the biblical church. The biblical church is an aircraft carrier where everybody is at work, some focus on feeding the crew, keeping the ship steady, but so that you can get in your jets and go off and fly missions. That is the church. Or we've talked about the football stadium. Many people view Larger churches where it's the staff, it's the professionals on the field playing the game. That is not the picture. The picture is of the membership on the field playing the game. The staff, the elders are the coaches. And where is God in the picture? He's empowering the players, he's empowering the coaches, and he's in the stands cheering. Okay, that is the New Testament church. So here's the big picture. This is the bottom line of what's going on here in Ephesians 4. Jesus is our Savior. Amen. 
Jesus is our redeemer and justifier. We'll keep preaching that. It's all over the Bible. But sometimes we fail to see that Jesus is also the model of our life, of how to follow God. What do I mean? Well, Jesus provides us the human example of what it means to be radically dependent upon the Holy Spirit to serve the purposes of God. Jesus, with respect to his human nature, I know this is crazy, this is wild stuff, Jesus, fully God, is also fully man, and with respect to his humanity, he was radically dependent upon the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill his call. Listen to John. Someone said amen in the first service too. Amen. So John 1, 32 to 34, this is John the Baptist. He says, John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him, on Jesus. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of God. So in order to baptize us with the spirit, Jesus had to have the spirit baptize him. Wow. And then in Acts chapter 10, Peter is preaching 37 to 38. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptisms that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. That's what it means to be Messiah, anointed with the Holy Spirit. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him, the God of anointing. Jesus healed, he did his miracles, and he taught with power and authority because he was filled with the Spirit. Jesus is our Savior, amen. But Jesus is also the man full of the Holy Spirit, showing us what it means to follow God. We even see this in our passage. Look at verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the the head into Christ. We are to be formed in Christ. We are saved by Christ so that we are formed into the likeness of Christ together and as individuals. So picture Jesus. He's a victorious king in heaven, and he has given the spoils of war, the teaching offices of the church. The church is now growing deep, and it's overflowing its banks into mission, and all of this is for the glory of God because the church is a temple filled with the Spirit. Now, some of you are like, oh, well, but hold on, Jay. You keep talking about spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit. Well, those aren't here. Well, actually, the Spirit's definitely in verses 1 through 6. He's all over Ephesians. But I understand the classic list of the gifts of the Spirit are not in here. They're in places like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. But I just wanted to talk about how equip is biblical. We're not doing this for sloganeering, We're not doing this as a pitch so that I can get my kingdom investors into this church. We're just wanting to obey scripture. Okay, so now let's talk about the gifts, an overview of the gifts, some qualifiers. As I mentioned, we've got lists in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, but pretty much everybody agrees that those are not exhaustive. They might be primary, kind of big headings, but there's lots and lots of ways the Spirit has gifted you. There are debates about the spiritual gifts. Are they totally different than natural talent and acquired training ability? I don't want to get too far into that because I just don't think there's an easy answer. I think there's overlap. Uh, Some of you had giftedness before you came to know the Lord, and then you came to know the Lord, and that giftedness is used for his glory. I think that's a spiritual gift. Some of you have gifts that will come along later in life. Some of you had primary gifts 10 years ago, and that's not your primary gift anymore. The key thing here is that the spiritual gifts are abilities God has given us by the Spirit's work in us to build up the church and to advance the gospel. But please, please remember, the gifts must operate with the balancing force of our fruit, the character of Jesus in us, as we depend radically on the disciplines of the Spirit, the Word of God, prayer, discipleship, things like that. Okay, so let me give you some categories. These are not authoritative. You might find other categories to be more helpful to you, but often we tend to group some of these gifts together, and these categories make sense to me, okay? So I'm going to talk about the love ministry category, the word ministry category, 
and the demonstration of power ministry. So love ministry gifts would be gifts like administration, helps, service, mercy, giving. Word ministry gifts would include teaching, exhortation, governance, evangelism. Demonstration ministry. This is where God, often without preparation or knowledge beforehand, gives someone an ability that is supernatural to discern or teach or work. So prophecy, tongues, interpretation, faith, discernment, healing, wisdom. And some of you are like, did you say tongues and healing? This is a Bible church. You know that, right? Yeah, I know that. Been here 13 years. I don't see anything in the Bible that says those gifts have ceased. 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, not the close of the canon. Um, happy to have coffee later and talk with you some about that. Now, these gifts might be used differently after the apostolic age and the close of the canon. But I think, and we're not a charismatic church, meaning we don't feel like those are vital to practice publicly on a regular basis. But some of you have those gifts, and some of you just got released in this moment to say, you mean I can talk about this? Yeah, you can. Well, Jay, if we keep going down that road, some crazy things might start to happen at the Bible church. Yep. Yep. Okay, so let me give you some examples. I won't define every single gift, but here are some definitions. Administration. This is the person who, in the power of God, is a a happy second chair. They don't need to be the one out in front. In fact, they love freeing up other people with resources and organization for them to maximize their gifts and service. And usually the person who's a gifted teacher or visionary or exhorter is really not good at administration. I don't know. I don't have any personal experience with that. But they need the administrators to, like, point them in the right direction, okay? The mercy, people with gifts of mercy see pain, And by the work of the Spirit, they go to that place and they present Jesus with his compassion and he is healing. The person who's gifted in giving has a peculiar burden to give resources in significant ways with profound joy that often leads to others growing in general giving. So an aside here, a lot of these gifts are general calls on every believer. Like everybody is called to be generous and give in this room, but there are people with a peculiar gift and they use it in maximal ways often to get the rest of us excited about giving, the rest of us excited about giving mercy, the rest of us excited about praying more deeply, okay? Uh, Exhortation. This is a person gifted with pressing in the truth of God with love. In fact, if it's the Holy Spirit, it will be done with love. Often exhortation travels with the gift of discernment. And this is where the fruit of the Spirit is really important. Uh, A lot of folks in a church like this, a teaching church, theologically thoughtful church, tend to have the gift of discernment, right? And I would say about 50% of the time, in my experience, the gift is demonstrated with love so that someone can, like, call you out And the Spirit is pointing out a sin in your life, a foolishness in your life, a falsehood in your life, but they're hugging you. And you leave going, wow, that was kind of hard, but I'm really thankful God used that person in my life. But then there are those who are discerning, actually speaking the truth, but they kick you in the shins. And it's confusing because all you know is your shins hurt. And so... If you have that gift, amen and amen, but you must use it with the fruit of the Spirit, humbly and lovingly, okay? Um, When it comes to preaching, I think three things are going on. This is what makes preaching different than uh, teaching. I think it is teaching, but it's also exhortation, and I think it's the prophetic. I think that is expository, anointed preaching. Gifts of service. It's the special ability to get things done for the good of the whole, often behind the scenes. In fact, that is so a spiritual gift because the Spirit himself is often called the humble member of the Trinity. The Spirit doesn't like to get the attention. He wants the attention to go to Jesus. 
And so he's always empowering people and things to give attention and focus to Jesus. And you are reflecting that, those of you who have the gift of service. And there's a lot of you in this room that have that gift. And then there's the gift of prophecy, a special ability to speak the truth with insight and relevance, and sometimes extemporaneously without any preparation. So in light of all of that, um, I want to say some really important things, otherwise you're not going to take this into your soul. Number one, every child of God has a bundle of gifts. Every child of God, because you are filled with the Spirit. Did you know that? You were converted, and you were immediately filled with the Spirit. God has given you gifts. Your gifts may overlap with the staff, but that does not mean you are called to uh, vocational ministry. Most of the gifts are to be used outside the profession of ministry. Okay, as your lawyers and athletes and students and bricklayers and electricians and teachers, you have gifts to be used to build the church in this maturity, into this Christ-likeness, so that we can then advance the gospel in our cities. And God is sovereign, and he knows what he's doing, And what God likes to do is to make sure he apportions the right gifts and the right uh, balance in local churches. But sometimes we can get this wrong because we think certain gifts are the best gifts and we all aspire to that. And this is what ends up happening. I'm going to put another slide up here. The, uh, The other graphic. There we go. Um, when the New Testament talks about the body, it's really talking about the human body, okay? But so many churches end up being Mr. Potato Head. They want to be in governance, and they want to be in teaching. And that's all cranium with tiny little hands and feet. And I don't know if you've ever tried to run in a Mr. Potato Head outfit, but it doesn't work. You need actually legs and knees, okay, and hip joints. (laughs) And that's why so many churches can be really deep theologically and doctrinally really accurate, and they're not going anywhere, okay, because we're Mr. Potato Heads. We need to be the actual human body. The head's important. It directs things, but it's a relatively small part of the overall body. Most of the real estate is torso and, and arms and legs, okay? And that's, and Jesus is in the business of making sure all Local churches are apportioned that way. And, and, and what that ends up doing is it, it hit, lets the church hit on all cylinders, but also there's a proper complementation and counterbalancing that the gift sets have. So, for instance, administrators gifted with the Spirit are really good at saying one plus one equals two. That's right, at least in this space-time continuum. But then there are the people with the gift of faith. And they're people who see the future in light of the promises of God, even when present circumstances go against it. And they're the ones that say, we need to trust the promises and the power of God. And they remind the administrators that one plus one done in the power of the flesh is zero. And one plus one in the power of the Holy Spirit can be 10,000. All right? So you've got to have all of the gifts working together. And so just as it is malformed to have powerful gifts without the fruit of the Spirit, it is also malformation to have deep piety without joyful practice of Jesus' holy spoils in your life. Now, how do you discover your gifts? Some of you know what they are, but I imagine there's a good number of Christians in this room that aren't aware of the gifts God has given you, which you have right now. How do you discover them? The first one, ask him. Ask him. God cares more about this than you do. Ask him, what are your gifts? And I promise you, the Lord will answer that through a personal story that you're going to have of a journey of discovering your gifts. But I promise you, if you ask him to reveal the gifts to you, he's going to reveal the gifts to you. And generally, he's going to use four pathways to do that. Your desire, the voice of the community, patterns, and fruit. 
So as you're asking the Lord, what you're ending, what you're doing there is you're, you're seeking his face, you're communing with him. And if you want to know God's purpose for your life, it's done in intimacy with Jesus. And so you're going to have a desire he puts in your heart. There's going to be a pebble in your shoe. It's going to cause you to seek opportunities of, of, of service and ministry. And then what you need is the voice of the community. Don't try and discern this on your own. Get out there and start serving the Lord. And other believers, you have an obligation to help your brothers and sisters discern where God has gifted them. In 1994, I was a wee college student at uh, a Young Life camp in Northern California called Woodleaf. I was on the summer staff. And the summer staff had supervisors who were on Young Life staff, and they would kind of coach you and minister to you as the college staff. And for the guys, his name was Warren Shanky. And Warren was hard to believe, but my age, late 40s, but he was a power lifter in college and still kept up with it. And uh, this is where he and I diverged. He was just <laughs> built, big guy, uh, very handsome, and yet the most gentle man. He was constantly singing hymns, uh, reciting scripture. I just, he was so spirit filled. And Warren made it a practice to meet with each of us at least once just to give us a feedback and reflect with us what we're growing, what the Lord's doing in our life. So Warren said, hey, why don't we go and meet, uh, play pool in, um, in one of the uh, kind of this room with a lot of games in it. So one afternoon we're playing pool and Warren is encouraging me and talking about what I'm learning. And then without me seeing it coming, he took his massive power lifting hand and he slammed the pool table so powerfully that all the balls just went poof, like that. It's like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And he looks at me very intimidatingly and he says, so we get together in our staff meetings in the evening and we're doing Bible studies and we're talking and a bunch of people are talking and some individuals talk a lot and you're off in the corner and maybe you'll say one thing. And do you notice that the whole room gets quiet and looks to you? He says, Jay, you have the gift of exhortation and teaching, and you're not using it. That is not up to you. God has given it to you, and you must use it. Now, I am stubborn and thick-headed, so I need Warren Shanky's hand to come down on that pool table. But I promise you he'll do the same thing for you. I mean, that set me on a trajectory. And so, brothers and sisters, you are obligated to do that for others. And you are obligated to seek that from others. So you're going to have the voice of the community. Then you're going to have patterns. You're going to start using these gifts. And you're going to see God use them in certain ways to, build about, to bring about the building of the church and the glory of Jesus. So you're going to see fruit. You're going to see people grow in their love for Jesus. You're going to see the gospel advance in your spheres. You're going to see truth abounding. You're going to see people protected from sin and evil. You're going to see the needs of a church accomplished through you, primarily through you who are not staff. You are going to accomplish the work of Jesus at this church and through this church. And please know that every gift is a grace. We celebrate the very visible and the highly influential. Again, the head is an important part of the body, but most of the body is torso and limbs. Every gift is equal. Every gift is essential. So why is this such a hard thing for so many evangelical churches? Number one, I don't think we teach this enough and we don't create pathways to equip. So it is, it is part of the leadership's responsibility that you can pray for that we create these pathways. We want this to be one uh, a season of growing in that. Um, so we have morning services like this, but there's so many other pathways. Like for the sisters in this room, we have the well Bible study. And brothers, we've got this study coming up next month in growing in, in biblical manhood. I've signed up. I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to open the time, the first session. Uh, there are so many different ways of being equipped in this church. So that is the leadership's primary responsibility is to equip you. So take advantage of that equipping. Also in our Reformation gospel-centered tribe, we emphasize Christ as our justifier. Amen. Amen. We will continue to do that. But we fail to emphasize Christ as the model of following God. 
as the Spirit-filled man so that you can follow him, follow him in being a Spirit-filled man or woman. We need both. Here's another big reason. In larger churches, we, whether we like it or not, convey that it is okay to come and spectate. So you come into this room with all these people and you're like, really? They don't need me. And, and we've got this building and we've got, you know, a good gifted staff and elders and deacons. You don't feel like you were needed. Well, that's a lie. You are needed. I don't care what the size of the church is. One of the cool things about church plants where you've got like 50 people venturing out and planting a church, you're, you're, you're renting a facility, it's got to be set up, you've got to have greeters. You, you, everybody feels like, man, if I do not pull at these oars, this thing is not going to happen. So everybody is mobilized. And then the church grows, and you get a building, and you get professionals, and all that stuff, and it just numbs the membership. And so I'm going to be praying, and I invite you to pray, that the Lord would give a proper perspective that every believer in this room is necessary for us to be hitting on all cylinders. So would you pray for that? Would you pray for that? Again, some of you will use your gifts programmatically through this church. Many of you will do that. But this is also for your Monday through Saturday. Okay? But here's the big thing and the final thing. I was listening to an interview of a pastor named John Mark Comer, who was in Portland for many years as a pastor and now is a writer and a thinker and a speaker based in Southern California. And he said, at the end of the day, a church has to change its social contract. You can use the aircraft analogy all day long, the aircraft carrier, the football team analogy all day long, but if a church does not change its social contract, contract. It will focus on the fruits of the Spirit, which is good, and the practices of the Spirit, which is good, but it will not really live into the gifts of the Spirit. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I am going to be praying for that. Have you noticed how many times I brought up prayer this morning? Um, last week I wasn't teaching and Rebecca and I felt led to go to the boiler room to pray for the first service. And I thought I would see, I don't know, five to eight people there. Not so much. It was us two. And it was our privilege to pray for the first service. And then the prayers started to boil over. Uh, prayers for our leadership. Prayers for our mission. Prayer for Jesus to be glorified in our church. Um, I know some of you have responsibilities in the first hour, but some of you have the gift of prayer. That's a gift. All of us should be praying, but some of you have an anointing from God to pray. Can I invite you to be a part of that? Because the engine of everything we're talking about this morning is prayer. Will you participate in lifting this church with the power of your prayers during our morning services? And so we've got to drastically pray, uh, desperately pray, praying with vigor that Jesus would make this happen as we submit to him, as we submit to him. Uh, I, I know that sometimes um, the work of Jesus is going to be numbed by undealt with sin. And so I'm going to ask you, to give yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, if there is sin in my life that I'm not dealing with and it is getting in the way of the Holy Spirit working at my church, that you would, you would do that. I am doing that. I am doing that. Who has seen the movie The Boys in the Boat? All right, good. The rest of you should see it. Um, it's based on the book, which was about the 1936 Olympic rowing team, which was comprised of a, a bunch of, like, blue-collar boys that went to the University of Washington, had an amazing coach. 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Nazi regime is on the rise, and they take the gold me medal beating Germany. True story. So the movie comes out Christmas Day, took the family to see it. I didn't just watch the movie, I felt it. I remember 
So many of you said, have you seen the movie? Because uh, I have shared before that I was in the all-American sport of rowing in high school. And I remember the bloody blisters and almost passing out and sometimes actually passing out and all of that stuff. Um, so in uh, 1988 and 1989, um, the rowing team of my high school, and do not picture some fancy dancy prep school. It was a public school. <laughs> and what had happened is a guy named Lou Lindsay, who was the coxswain, the, the little guy steering the boat. He was the coxswain of the 1960 American Olympic team. And then for several years, he was the coach at Stanford. And before he retired, he decided to try and experiment what he could do with a high school, public high school team. So my high school was near Body of Water. And um, he developed this team, and he had a bunch of like really progressive coaching practices. And in 1988 and 1989, uh, the team did well enough to qualify for the nationals. So they drove those boats out all the way to Philadelphia to the Stotesbury Cup, and they lined up against Exeter and Groton and LaSalle and all the fancy-dancy uh, schools that feed the Ivy Leagues, and they won. They won. Um, we had a corrugated uh, steel boathouse, and the bad news bears of the crew world uh, won. So I was a freshman in high school in 1988-89, and I was the coxswain. No, no teasing, but I was the little guy that rode the boat, um, everybody had a nickname, and mine was Sprout. And um, <laughs> the coach said, Sprout, come over here. And um, the varsity team was very intimidating. Uh, they were fast, and they knew it. Um, and they said, the two varsity coxswains are out with the flu. You're coxing the novice A boat. You're going you're gonna to go and cox the boat for practice today. So... <laughs> I uh, was very intimidated, but out we go. And um, this high school boat, it was said, was the third fastest boat on the West Coast, only superseded by the varsity boat of UC Berkeley and the University of Washington. Um, and it was amazing. Uh, crew is really hard because you have a boat that's 62 feet long and about 18 inches wide. And the way to be fast and balanced is in the water at the exact same time, out of the water at the exact same time. And it was like a master clinic in rowing. And uh, you get to do these low-speed drills, medium drills, and then you get to go to race speed. And I got to experience something that I hadn't with our novice team yet, and it's called swing. And it is where you are fast and you are smooth. And eight young men are rowing as one. And that is what the Lord wants for his church. He wants you to use your gifts as he is apportioned together so that we row with swing for the glory of Jesus. But again, we cannot do this without prayer. So let's pray. Jesus, I, I pray for our church. I pray for our body. I pray for our family. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would have us in a way we've never experienced this year. I pray that he would come, whether we invite him or not. Where there are idols and when, where, there is when there, where there is masked sin, Please come and break down those idols. Weed out that sin. Replace those spaces with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Create us into a temple. Where there are undiscovered gifts, I pray in 2024, those gifts would be discovered joyfully and used lovingly. Spirit of God, descend upon this place. And Lord, one of the results I pray for, I deeply, passionately, dependently, desperately pray for, is that many would come to faith in Jesus Christ through this church empowered with the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.